So our next presenter uh, is uh, Dr. Ali Osman, uh, Dr. Francis Ali Osman. Dr. Ali Osman, uh, he has recently moved to Phoenix. Uh, he went to the uh, University of uh, Texas for medical school in San Antonio. He continued there with his um, surgical training. He then moved to Dallas, Texas and did his um, acute care surgery fellowship at the University of Texas, um, Southwestern University. Um, he's currently a general surgeon, trauma surgeon, and intensivist at John C. Lincoln North Mountain. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Mangrum. Um, it's a pleasure uh, for me to talk to you all today about uh, some innovations in operative rib fixation. Now, I'll start off with this caveat. You know, in most of our training as surgeons, you know, we're pretty much trained that we don't fix ribs. So this is really something that, you know, is kind of catching on more now. Um, however, historically, um, has not been done very often. Um, I just have to disclose that I'm a lecturer for the uh, SMART Lab, which is a, uh, the course that we give uh, through the De Pew Synthes uh, for their SMART Lab. Okay, so uh, rib fractures have been described for a very long time in, in you know, some of the oldest medical literature. <clears throat> we have to talk a little bit about chest wall mechanics. We all uh, know about the bucket handle uh, um, physiology. The uh, chest wall is very complex. It consists of multiple muscles, bones, the diaphragm, intercostal muscles, all the muscles overlying the chest wall, and all of these work together um, for, a, uh, for the breathing motion. So there's a lot of movement. <clears throat> Chest trauma in general is a persistent problem in our trauma population. It accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of all trauma admissions. Um, it's associated in about 25 percent of all traumatic deaths. And rib fractures are found in about 39 percent of blunt trauma patients. Now many of these patients have many other injuries as well, um, but um, rib fractures are very common. And uh, they can lead to uh, pulmonary insufficiency, prolonged convalescence, and uh, ventilator dependence. Um, about 60% of patients who uh, suffer from flail chest um, don't even return to full-time employment, even at five years. That's a pretty astounding statistic. So uh, a little bit about flail chest. It's described as three or more ribs uh, with segmental fractures, i.e. the ribs are broken in uh, more than one place. Uh, there's a bimodal distribution. We see it in our younger patients and in some of our older patients, especially those with osteopenia or osteoporosis. Um, the primary mechanism for rib fractures is blunt uh, trauma. Uh, we also see it with deceleration injuries. Um, there's a high association of scapular and clavicle fractures, especially with uh, rib fractures from uh, rib six or above. And the prognosis is variable, obviously depending upon uh, other uh, injuries that the patient may have. So if you look historically, um, you know, rib fractures have been a problem for so long, but uh, even uh, just, uh, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago, our methods of uh, managing these were pretty archaic. As you can see, uh, many different things had been tried, different ways of splinting, um, putting forceps into the chest uh, and, and hanging them to weights, different uh, ventilatory uh, techniques, all of which really didn't have much success. So it wasn't until 1980 um, that the first uh, plates, commercially available plates for this came out. Um, this was one of the early uh, examples. This is a rib lock plate. Um, it consists of a small titanium plate that fits over the fractured segment of the ribs. It's got two screws that go in on either side. Um, by far the most widely used system is the, uh, the, the Pew Synthes system, the matrix rib, which consists of uh, various uh, plates of different contours that are designed for different ribs on either side. Um, these are made out of flexible titanium and uh, screw into the rib. So a little bit about our surgical technique. Um, Historically, when uh, rib fixation was first introduced, uh, very large incisions were, were used. As you can imagine, the chest wall is, uh, is covered by a number of uh, muscles in addition to the skin and the fat, especially if you have a larger patient. And these made, um, these made, um, made the, the operations much larger, and the incisions were larger and more painful. 
So uh, what we uh, have done here at, uh, at Honor Health is uh, we're focusing more on making smaller incisions and trying to reduce the patient's pain uh, from the operation. So um, our technique in involves a traditional double lung ventilation. Uh, we put the patient in the lateral decubitus position. Um, we use as minimal a thoracotomy incision as possible. We raise superior and inferior flaps. Um, we try to spare the latissimus as much as possible. When necessary, we sometimes will divide it um, in line with the fibers just to get enough space to get underneath it to, uh, to put our plates on. Um, the serratus is almost always d divided to some degree as it lies directly on the muscle. Um, then we manually reduce the fracture. We measure the rib, place the uh, appropriate plate, and on all of our cases, we uh, wash out the chest uh, with uh, copious amounts of saline and leave a 24 French fluted uh, Blake drain as our chest tube. And um, as of the last probably seven or eight months, we've been putting um, subcutaneous pain catheters in to uh, give a continuous intercostal nerve block. And then uh, we lavage until clear and then do a layered closure. So these are some examples of um, you know, larger incisions. Um, you know, these are similar to incisions that a thoracic surgeon may use, you know, to do a big thoracotomy. And this is actually what we try to get away from. This is, you know, the exposure is great on these, but as you can see, you know, there's a lot of dissection, probably more pain. Um, our incisions are focused more on where the fractures are. Um, quite often you'll have multiple fractures that are lined up and down, so rather than making the traditional curvilinear thoracotomy incision, we'll actually make a, uh, decision, an incision up and down just uh, to get down to where the fractures actually are. And with these incisions, once you raise your flaps, you can actually get uh, quite a bit of exposure just by carefully retracting the muscles, um, sometimes even with a self-retaining retractor. Um, one of the other things that we've, uh, we've incorporated into our, our rib fixations is uh, epidurals. Um, you know, there's no question epidurals help with pain in rib fractures, but uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of that is dependent on your anesthesiologist, their availability and their willingness to do it. Um, we are very fortunate in that we do have an anesthesia department that puts in a lot of these. At least probably about half of our rib fractures, get a, severe rib fractures, will get epidurals. Um, we've also been uh, adding our subcutaneous pain catheters. We use the on-Q catheters shown here. Um, and uh, the whole concept of this is in addition to helping decrease the post-operative pain by putting it in the wound, we have the advantage of being right there, so it's very simple to place. We normally place two of these, and we place one of them more posterior so we can get closer to the nerve roots of the intercostal muscles to help with, uh, with post-operative pain. So as we look a little bit at the literature and uh, rib fixation, um, it's actually pretty sparse. Um, again, it's not a procedure that's done that often if you look at it nationwide, um, but there are a few papers here. Um, this first one looked at a, a, a multitude of rib fractures within a certain time at a single center, and they separated uh, 171 patients into four groups. And uh, what they found was essentially patients who were over the age of 45 years or older and had greater than four rib fractures were at increased risk for adverse outcomes. Um, as we look at this particular study, uh, this was a retrospective study where they looked, where they were trying to look at long-term results and quality of life after rib fixation. There were only 10 patients here, and um, basically uh, the uh, they showed that the patients who had their ribs plated um, were very happy with their operation um, several weeks post-operative, i.e. Their, their levels of pain were, uh, were good and they were able to get back to doing the things that they normally did. Again, none of these are, are very strong papers, but I think that's just a testament to, um, you know, to the lack of literature on this topic. Um, another study here, um, they looked at a surgical rib fixation specifically for patients with flail uh, chest, and uh, what they found was that um, in a patient who had flail chest and required ven mechanical ventilation, they were actually able to get those patients off the ventilator faster um, if their ribs were, were fixed. <clears throat> and then um, this uh, 
other long-term study where they looked at 101 patients, well, they sent the survey out to 101 patients, got 50 responses, um, and in, um, at about a little over five weeks, uh, pain was gone in 90% of the patients, and they were all able to return to work um, by about two months, which is a lot better than the, uh, the initial statistics. So uh, a couple uh, specific cases uh, just uh, that we can review. Um, this first case is a patient who was admitted in June of 2014. Um, pretty large guy, BMI is 50, uh, 35 years old. He's obese and has sleep apnea. Um, he had multiple bilateral rib fractures with a pneumothorax. Um, he was admitted on the 11th, intubated uh, immediately upon arrival um, after he was in respiratory distress and then taken to the operating room the next day. <clears throat> this is his initial x-ray. Um, not the best quality secondary to the patient's size, um, but when we look at his CAT scans, you can see um, multiple areas of broken ribs. These are 3D reconstructions. We do this on all of our uh, patients with severe rib fractures whose ribs we're considering fixing. And as you can see, I mean, this is a pretty bad flail chest. Um, you can see multiple ribs broken in different places. Um, that's the uh, right side, and then here's the left side. So we took him to the operating room. We actually did this in a staged fashion. We actually did the right side first. That was the worst of the two, and then uh, brought him back a few days later to do the other. And uh, this is what the post-operative x-ray looks like. You can see four plates on the right side and two on the left with um, pretty well expanded lungs. Again, you know, this guy weighs almost 400 pounds. Um, his hospital course, um, um, he went to the OR for the two operations and then was extubated the day after the second operation, transferred out of the ICU three days later, um, continued to progress with physical therapy, was actually discharged to a rehab facility um, on hospital day 15. Now, you know, as I recall throughout my training, most of the time if you get a, you know, 400 pound guy with a bilateral flail chest, at least 10 to 12 broken ribs, you know, the, I would bet that guy would be on a tracheostomy and end up in a nursing home. You know, this is a guy who got to go home and be with his kids after two weeks in the hospital. Uh, we, did, we are looking at pulmonary function tests. Um, we're trying to get these preoperatively when we can. In this particular case, we weren't able to because he was able, you know, he was intubated on arrival. However, um, on post-op day two, his FEV1 and FVC were 17% of predicted, and those had already more than doubled by, um, by post-operative day seven. Our second case is a 63-year-old male who fell from a roof. Um, he had multiple left-sided rib fractures in the flail segment. Um, he was seen in the emergency room where, you know, he could barely even talk to us because he was in so much pain, and uh, we took him to the operating room the next day. Um, this is a 3D reconstruction of his CT chest. You can see some multiple lateral rib fractures and multiple posterior. So he had a classic flail chest. Remember, this is a 63-year-old guy. <clears throat> took him to the operating room the next day, put 10 plates in him, um, three of them on the uh, anterolateral side, and. Uh, and uh, seven of them uh, posteriorly. And uh, this was actually from a post-operative CT where you can see the plates nicely placed and the fractures reduced. And um, we saw improvements in his pulmonary function tests within a couple of days. I mean, this guy li literally went from not able to even talk to us barely to post-operative day one, walked a lap around the ICU at 63 years old. Case three is another 63-year-old who was involved in a motorcycle crash. Um, he had multiple fractures on both sides. He got an epidural on the day of admission and was taken to the operating room the following day for rib fixation. Here you can see multiple displaced uh, fractured ribs. And uh, this is his post-operative x-ray where you can see uh, six, seven, Five, no, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plates, sorry. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we saw improvements in his pulmonary function tests as well within a couple of days. So, so far to date, um, between May 2014 and October 2015, we've done 68 of these. There's actually a few more 
that weren't included since we're in November. Our average, average hospital length of stay was about nine days. Only three of those 68 patients required a tracheostomy. 56 of them were intubated immediately after surgery, and uh, 63, well, um, 63 were intubated for seven days or less. We had 26 epidural place, um, 37 on cue catheters, and 45 of those 68 went home. Remember, these are some of the more severe rib fractures. We're not talking about the patient with, you know, non-displaced fractures who's, you know, satting 95% on room air or a couple liters. Um, we had two post-operative infections um, at the chest tube site. These were managed locally. Two post-operative hemothoraces that required new chest tubes and um, two post-operative operative subcutaneous uh, hematomas that needed additional drainage. Uh, we had one pulmonary embolus and one death that was related to other injuries. Um, at uh, at uh, Honor Health, we have a G60 geriatric trauma service, so we've looked at some of our data in the last year for uh, patients over the age of 60 uh, that had fractured ribs, and um, by far the most common mechanism was motorcycle crash. Here in Arizona, we have a pretty large retired population, and um, they do everything that they did when they were 20 years old, it seems like. And so we see a lot of motorcycles fall from horses, ladders, roofs, et cetera. <clears throat> when we looked at our pulmonary function tests in these patients, we looked at them preoperatively um, in uh, postoperative day two to four and postoperative day five to seven. There actually was a statistically significant increase in pulmonary function uh, within five to seven days of surgery. And um, this is us working in the operating room. As you can see, our incision is actually really not that big. We use the Omni retractor here um, to facilitate um, um, our surgery. Uh, one of the instruments that has really revolutionized what we're able to do with our incisions is the right angle screwdriver. This was really initially designed for getting under the uh, scapula. Um, however, we've used it, you know, to uh, in pretty much everywhere else to be able to place these plates on, get our, get our screws in, and, um, and get it with a uh, much smaller incision. And so here's a uh, video of us working. As you can see, this incision is not very big. We've dissected down, pulled the, mu um, pulled the muscles off the chest wall, and you can see the amount of motion that we have here in the uh, chest wall. So as you can imagine, with every breath this patient takes, every time they try to cough, these things are moving and causing a lot of pain. And here's us working some more on the same patient. Uh, we've already started putting our first plate on. Um, this is a drill guide uh, that we use to make sure that we don't drill too far in, into the bone. It stops you from uh, piercing the lung. Uh, we drill our hole, then we take our guide off, and then we screw our screw in. This is us using the right angle uh, drill to drill a hole. As you can see, you can sneak around into small spaces with this low profile right angle uh, drill and screwdriver, which we'll see here in just a minute. And that allows us to get into those areas where uh, we would need a bigger incision to, to be able to use the more conventional uh, tools. And I think it's gone. And here it is. And we just screw that in. And then the finished product, no more paradoxical motion. The ribs are nice and secure. The plates are on. We've got at least three screws on each side of the fracture. And, uh, and the chest wall is, uh, is repaired. So in conclusion, rib fractures and their complications, they continue to remain a significant source of morbidity and mortality. I mean, all hospitals, trauma centers, non-trauma centers see plenty of them and that's not gonna change. Um, a majority of rib fractures can and should be managed non-operatively. Even as many as we've done, we're probably only fixing about 15% or so of all the rib fractures that we actually see. Um, it should be considered uh, strongly when patients have flail chest, significant displacement, or uh, worsening or refractory uh, respiratory insufficiency. 
And then adjuncts such as placement of epidurals and on -cue catheters can be very helpful in improving postoperative pain and pulmonary toilet. And of course, more research is needed. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions.